All right, so last week I spoke about Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, and about how our spirit is in communion with the Holy Spirit, and it's changed in form, it's transfigured into the likeness of Christ because of the transformation of our minds, which enables us to interpret His will, His scripture, His dreams, His visions, all the way He talks to us. Right, so this is the result of that transformation. And this is John 16, verse 23. And here Jesus is talking to his disciples about what will happen after his death. I'm going to give you a moment to find it. Okay, it says. At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth. You will ask the Father directly, and he will grant your request, because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name, and you will receive, and you will have abundant joy. Right, now the words in my name mean in my reputation which is the state of being held in high esteem, which is the Greek word, an onomar. Right? It, the, I like the way the Amplified Bible puts this. It says, in that day, you will not need to ask me about anything. I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, or whatever you ask the Father as my representative, he will give you. So Jesus is saying that who he calls his friends will be his representatives, will be in his reputation when we pray to the Father. So when we pray to the Father, the Father will see the Son in us. He'll see him enlarged in us because we're given up. So just to back that up a bit, in verse 26 it says in that day you will ask in my name and I am not saying to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf because it will be unnecessary so for the one Jesus the ones Jesus considers his friends he's giving more that sounds like the friends of the bridegroom and the bride to me um, But this is the relationship that Jesus wants with us. He wants to lift us up because he loves us. He's looking for people that also want this. And John 14 verse 21 just always blows me away. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So... One thing I always wondered was whenever we ask for something in his name, why does it happen sometimes and not others? You know, well, it's because he's trying to lead us to this. He's trying to lead us to be in close relationship with him. And it's only when we come into a close relationship with him that he can trust us with his authority and his gifts. So he's putting his name to us as a mark of an approval. So in John 15, verses 14 and 15, he says, You are my friends. If you keep on doing what I command you, I do not call you servants any longer. For the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you my friends because I have revealed to you everything that I have heard from my father. I think it's safe to say that we all want that level of relationship with God. But in order to get there, we really need to be paying attention. So, as a, as, well, as a bit of a warning, I guess, I'm going to read from Luke 19, verse 12, and you'll recognize it. 
A noble went to a distant a nobleman went to a distant country to obtain for himself a kingdom and then to return. So he called his servants and gave them ten miners, one apiece, equal to a hundred days' wages. And he said to them, Do business with this until I return. But his citizens, the residents residents of his new kingdom, hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to be king over us. When he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these servants to whom he had given the money be called to him, that he might find out what business they had done. The first one came before him and said, Lord, your mina has made ten more minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you prove yourself faithful and trustworthy in a very little thing, you shall now have authority over ten cities in my kingdom. The second one came in and said, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him also, and you shall have charge over five cities. Then another said, Lord, here is your mina, which I have kept laid up in a handkerchief for safekeeping. I was always afraid of you because you are a stern man. You pick up what you did not lay down and you reap what you did not sow. So the arrogance of, of this attitude um, of blaming something else or someone else for, for not carrying out what he should have done is, is quite... Um, is quite astonishing, and to say it's a consequence of his master is is even more is even more arrogant. He could have done something. He could have at least um, have invested in someone else's endeavour, but instead he did nothing. He did absolutely nothing, and just expected it all to come to him. So he said to that servant, "I will judge and condemn you by your own words. You worthless servant, did you really know?" Did you really know that I was a stern man, picking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not, at that very least, put, put my money in a bank? Then on my return, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take, a mean, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten miners. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten miners already, Jesus explained. I tell you that to everyone who has more, Everyone who has, more will be given. But the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Now, this is disregarding the, the gifts that God's given us. It's not walking in what he's set out for us to do. It's not, it's not getting into relationship. It's not knowing your calling. It's not knowing what God expects from you. It's, it's but sitting there and doing nothing basically. Um, but one gift we do have from God is to be a friend of the bridegroom or be part of the bride. But we have to get there with being trusted with a little. So let's not jump the gun and think we've got to go running out and evangelise the world and get results and make it all happen now, now, now. The message is get yourself right now and then find out what you've got to do. Not go charging out thinking, because that's doing it all on your own, you know, with your own ideas. So let's not let a single thing God has done for us fall on hard ground. Let's not let a single thing or a single person be choked by the thorns and thistles of this world. Let's get into relationship with him and let's find out real guidance and real direction and let's start hearing him for ourselves you know we need to be seeking just as a daily habit seeking um the things of above with colossians 3 think about the things of heaven not the things of earth it's amazing how we get distracted straight back onto the things of earth you start thinking about something that's already happened in the day or you start planning what you're going to do tomorrow um, why not just think about the things of above think about what you've just been reading in the word pray, talk in tongues that's how you set your mind on the things of above 
So, you know, we need to hunger and desire to know these things. We need to hunger and desire for what does heaven look like? What, what does Jesus look like? You know, when, it, when I see him, what will he actually look like? Um, so as we all know, we need to be individually pushing in, and I'm quite sure everyone here is. Um, but the closeness to him is going to help us also discern the things in this world. You know, what's the point of God giving us a dream if we don't search after, after the meaning of it? So, let me just check this. Yeah, so, I'm going to read now from Luke 7, verse 41. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, cancelling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he cancelled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Well, the Christians who truly love the Lord, the ones that really go after him, are the ones that recognise they're the person with the larger debt. They recognise the price paid to redeem them. And they're the ones that are most grateful, the most mindful, the most changed, and the most joyful. Each one of us came at a price. He paid to redeem us and wiped the slate clean with his blood. And he wipes the slate clean every time we ask. His kindness and faithfulness to us is astounding. So let's be encouraged and push on. Let's show him we can be trusted with a little. Let's show him how we arrange our day to make talking to him a priority. Let's show him how much we want to know him by meditating on his word. You know, really, really delve deep into it, especially when there's something that you feel you don't understand. There's a reason you don't understand it. Let's show him how much we want to see his face by seeking it. Um, let's wait on him daily. And let's find out if he, he'll walk in the room. There's only one way to find out. It doesn't matter where you are in your Christian walk at all. All that matters is how much you trust him. And how many times you keep getting up. So don't worry about failure. It's about carrying on. I know Heidi once said some words that I found truly inspiring. It's not about how many times you get knocked down. It's about how many times you get back up. No, it was, sorry, I got that wrong. It was the only time you truly fail is when you fail to get back up again. So, our wonderful Lord Jesus has made a way for even the worst sinners to repent, to be changed. One man who made a huge change in his life it was the Apostle Paul. He went from hunting down and killing Christians to being one of the pioneers of spreading the gospel. He's an example of recognizing that he was the man with the large debt. So, in Acts 19, <laughs> verse 13. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried, to use the, excuse me, they tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. 
Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. Uh, this evil spirit picked upon the fact that they didn't know Jesus and certainly weren't in relationship with him. They were trying to use Jesus' name for themselves, not to glorify the Lord, not to help the person who was afflicted. It was to, for their glory. Now, at this time, uh, the Jews would travel around uh, Gentile regions because the, uh, the Gentiles found that the Jewish culture, especially the religion, they found it exotic and, and fascinating. So they'd go around um, calling themselves chief priests to advertise their services, taking advantage of this fact. You know, so... Um, so they tried to use Jesus' name mechanically. They said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, because Jesus was a common name then. Well, evil spirits don't need uh, extra identification to know who Jesus is. If there's one person they know, it's, uh, it's Jesus. Um, yeah, so it was a common name then. Um, so the sons of Sceva thought they were being clever by making sure they got the right Jesus. Um, yeah. But what impresses me about this is the evil spirit said, I know Jesus, I know Paul. How incredible is that? That is truly remarkable. That's how close Paul was to Christ. And I feel quite confident to say he was a friend of Christ. I think it's a certainty he was a friend of Christ. Um, because he had that authority. Even the evil spirits knew who Paul was. And I also imagine it's down to the fact that Christ was so enlarged in him that they couldn't miss it. And so Paul walked in the trust of Christ and had the authority of Christ. But someone else, that also reminds me of, makes me think of someone who recognised they were the one with the great debt, was the woman at the well. Um, she was there at noontime for a start. So we all know that was a, a bad you know, that was not the normal time for a woman to be at the well. It means she was ostracised from a community because the women would go in the morning in the cool of the day. Uh, <clears throat> but she was so joyful. Um, she evangelised the whole village. This is also a great example of the mustard seed of faith. You know, Jesus says, I'll tell you the truth, even if you had faith, as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. This woman had just learned who Jesus was, and she moved the whole village. So, but also in this, in this uh, account of the woman at the well, Jesus says to her, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Now, one thing I've found personally is that, I'm not saying I'm there yet, but as I'm coming out of the world, I'm less entertained by the things of the world, the less appealing. And I find myself not hungering to, to engage in the things of the world. Um, I'm just, just not bothered by it. And I'm really enjoying that change and I'm really encouraged. I'm not saying I'm there yet, don't get me wrong. 
Uh, but yeah, the more time I spend with the Lord, instead of focusing on the things of this world, um, it's replaced by a hunger and thirst for Jesus. Um, but the world can start to creep back in. This is why Jesus says, remain in me. You know, we've got to stay focused and be careful not to drift. Because if you have distractions and things go wrong, um, you can burst pipes, and it throws you off for a couple of days. It can be strangely difficult to get back into that routine you were, you were quite normally in. So we've, we've got to be on guard and remain focused and make sure we remain in him. Right. So, what is your heart's desire? What, what do you want from the Lord? See, in Psalm 37 verse 4 it says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. So, what is your heart's desire? You know, when I, I thought about this myself, I thought, okay. I didn't have an answer there straight away. I had to actually sit, sit and think, you know, what is it I actually want from him? Because he wants to give you your heart's desire. He loves you. So, Matthew nine twenty says, Just then, a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe, for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. Now, the desire of her heart was to be healed by him, by touching the hem of his garment, because it wouldn't make him unclean. She completely believed he was the Christ and that he was so holy and from God that all she had to do was just touch the hem of his garment. So she set her heart on him. So her faith made her well. And in a few chapters on, in Matthew fourteen thirty six, it says, they begged him to let the sick, sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. So others had heard about what this woman had done, and they believed the same thing would happen to them, and it did. You know, we hear in fellowship what works for one often works for another. Sometimes it doesn't. Maybe the difference is what you set in your heart on. So what are you really wanting? What is really your heart's desire? So... I'm going to switch now to the Pharisees. Hmm. Now, the Pharisees at this time were all focused on acts of following the law, as we all know. They didn't look after the widows or the orphans, as they should, because they weren't changed internally. The world had given them wealth position and authority they didn't realize they were lacking now these things wealth position authority they're like a mirage you think there's water up ahead but when you actually get there there's nothing and that's what makes those people that realize they have the large debt so special and it's why they're so loved. It's because the heart and the mind is what's affected, what's changed. 
So the Pharisees' acts did not come from relationship with God. They came from looking good to the rest of the world. You know, with the stoning of the adulteress, where was the man? If you follow the law of Moses, you must obey every regulation of the whole law, and the Pharisees weren't. So where, where was the man? Why aren't they following it through? Why didn't the crowd, anyone in the crowd, say anything? They all just followed. No, no, one, no one questioned anything. They all just accepted what they were given uh, by the Pharisees. And it makes me wonder, were they going after God themselves? Or were they just... Or, or were they the, the servant with the one miner who just wrapped it up in a handkerchief? I, I think I uh, would all love to know what Jesus wrote in the sand. But I think the point is when the light of the world turned up, the darkness had to run from it because the darkness was going to be exposed. So, you know, they were trying to destroy someone's life with a lie, maybe, when theirs could be exposed by the truth. And if nothing else, that truth was that they weren't following the law. So let's make sure we know God better than deceiving religious leaders and fake prophets that are going to come along. Let's make sure we know him better than they do. So, you know, the, the one thing I love about coming here is, is the attitude of the fellowship of bushfire in that there's, there's, there's no teachers here. We're all students. And I love that. We all learn from each other. We all learn from each other's personal revelation and experience. And um, I really find that a, a huge encouragement. So I really do. So anyway, so why does God do miracles? It's to break us out of spiritual slumber. It's to get people saying that's not physically possible. Then in that awakening, the spiritual truths are realized. And then when the spiritual truths are realized, the internal changes start happening. People start being moved by the word of God. They start praying, they start changing. And change is what's needed. Let's start with the little things, the little ones. So it's a short one today, and thank you for listening. God bless you.